through uh, Genesis. I don't feel too bad. A, friend, a preacher friend of mine, when he's preaching through Ephesians, he spent a whole year from six chapters. So we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't gotten to that point yet. So let's look at chapter 7 of Genesis. And this is this is this this is this flood story uh, as given. This is probably the most controversial aspect of the first eleven chapters of Genesis. Uh, was there was there a flood? Was there a world flood? Uh, did all this happen uh, according to the word of God at a particular time? And so this morning we will we'll look at uh, the, the historical aspect of it, and also we'll see the universality of it, and we'll see how sudden it happened as well. So this is a, a great story, but also it's a very evangelistic story as well. So let's look at chapter 7. If you have your Bible, uh, look at, or a pew Bible, uh, look at chapter 7 with me uh, of the flood. Moses, Moses, the author of Genesis, he writes, And the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You should take with you of every clean animal by, by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals this is not clean, that are not clean to, T-W-O, a male and his female. Also the birds of the sky, by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Then Noah and all his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Now we'll learn next week that they spent a little over a year in the ark. Quite a long time. But we'll do we'll with that next, next week. Uh, verse 8. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the... There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the six, now this verse 11 is very important. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. And on every on the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Jacob, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, that every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, and which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded them, and the Lord closed it behind them. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere where, the, where under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed 15 cubits high, which is about a little over 22 feet high, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth, perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all of those nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds, 
the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. To understand, to understand chapter 7 of Genesis, we first must understand God. Most people say, if I ask you to describe God, most people would say what? God is love. And then you would say, well, how can a loving God flood the whole world and kill the whole world except for eight people? Well, God is a holy God. That's the main description of God in Scripture. And being a holy God means that God is not only a God of love, but He's a God of wrath as well. A God of judgment as well. And this is what we must recognize. You see, in the, in the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, God says that you'll have no other gods before me, or it translates out in Hebrew, you'll have no other gods before my face. So before my face, you should not have any idols any God that you worship other than me. And now we can, we can delineate those. We can say, well, what kind of idol could that be? Well, if we read the scriptures, they created idols in wood and idols in metal. It also could be an idol of flesh. It can be your spouse. It can be your child. It can be your grandchild. It can be whomever it may be. Be your idol. And God says you should have no idol before my face. Now we see this in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, and he says in Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so every idol that you create cannot hold the living water of God. Every idol, whatever it may be, Again, maybe your job, it may be your education, maybe your bank account, whatever it may be, it may be your God. And thus we see in Jeremiah 4 4, he says, the Lord says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judea, of Judea and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else, or listen, or else, my, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn none to quench. It's because of the evil of your deeds. And so if we have idols, then we have, we have done what? We have created, we have created uh, deeds and that we're, by worshiping them that, that he will bring destruction uh, to our lives or to the whole world like in the case of Noah. So how do you know you have an idol? It's how much you think about it that fame or person. It's how much money you spend on that particular thing. And the bigger third reason is if that person or thing were removed from your life, would it cripple you spiritually, physically, or emotionally? That's a good test. So what happened in the, in, the, in the story of Noah and the flood? The world was worshiping idols, not seeking God. Only one did it was Noah. As we learned last week in Peter, that Noah preached righteousness, but none came. For 120 years, Noah preached, but none came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God's patience wore out and he sent the flood that destroyed the entire world. So let's look at this as well. So we see in Genesis 7 God's judgment in a catastrophic way of destroying the whole world. So the first thing we want to look at is God's judgment on the earth is a fact. It is a fact. There are approximately I uh, read this week, 270 flood stories. 270. And all these different flood stories from different countries come out of this flood story that we find in Scripture. 
But these flood stories do not want to recognize, do not want to recognize uh, that God is totally in charge, that God is totally sovereign. And so many think this is a myth, that this really didn't happen. So, but I say this, if you can believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can believe in that God sent a flood upon the earth. Amen. You see, the key is this. The key in understanding the scripture from Genesis to Revelation <coughs> is the key, did God tell you a lie in scripture? In Titus, it says God can't lie. And so if God is the one who inspired the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, would God tell you any untruth? Are there mistakes in the Bible? Are there half-truths in the Bible? Does the Bible just contain the truth, or is the Bible the truth? And if the Bible contains only the truth, then who decides what is true and what is not? Then it boils down to this. It boils down to your reason and your experience. Because your experience will, uh, every time, your reason and experience will trump the Word of God. Because you don't want to change your life. You want to just keep it the same. And so the first, this, this chapter of 7 of Genesis is, tells us three things. First, the flood was historical. If we go back to verse 11 of chapter 7, and uh, theologian uh, Dietrich Kinder, he makes this statement that the precise date in 711 has the mark of a plain fact, well remembered, and this is borne out by the uh, further careful notes of time in the story. This is what he writes in his book, Genesis, page 90. And so, it, 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 so God gives us an exact date in verse 11, and the 600th year of Noah's life, and the second month on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. So, it's an historical day. When did the Civil War start? 1861. An historical day. But a friend of mine who discipled me way back 30, 40 years ago, he said, if you can remember 500 dates, you can know history. 500 dates, you can know history. And so the key is that we have a date here, a date defining, defining when the flood happened. Second, we know that Jesus, we looked at this, we looked at this last week, we know Jesus, Jesus and Peter, the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, 7, who lists the, uh, the, the Hall of Fame of Faith individuals, we see that they mention the flood. Why would Jesus mentioned the flood and it didn't really happen? Why would the Apostle Peter mention the flood and it not really happen? And so we see that it's historical even, in, even though this happened from Jesus' time almost 2,000 years ago Jesus said, hey, the flood really happened. Peter said the flood really happened. The writer of Hebrews said the flood really happened. And so we see that the historicity of the flood, that it is exactly what the Bible says it is. But also, the flood is universal as well. It's a universal flood. Many, many say the flood just happened in a certain area. But, if that is the case, if the flood was only a local, as some suggest, then, then no one and others could have moved to the other side of the mountain. Why build an ark? Amen. Why build an ark? If the flood was only local, it would not affect people or animals in other areas. And so one person wrote, uh, Morris, if the flood was local, how could the waters rise 20 feet above the mountains? Verse 11 and 12 say that the source of the flood was not only 40 days and nights of rain, but also the breaking up of a great deep. This points to a massive change in the oceans, the subterranean vaults of the earth, and describes much more water than of a local flood. Verses 19 and 20 say that all the high mountains everywhere were under the heavens were covered to a depth of 15 cubits, or about 23 feet. 
the mountains on earth but, uh, before the flood were not necessarily the same as afterwards. Now some say that God, when we go back to Genesis 1, that there was a canopy of water over the earth. And then in, in, the, un, in the subterranean of the earth, everything began to break up. And so water came from a where it came from underneath the earth, volcanoes probably erupted, and many say this is when the continents uh, began to form was through the, because of the flood. But we have the seven con continents today, and we know that 70% of the world today is water. All this happened, but we see it comes out of verse, it comes out of verse 11. And, and so God, most of the land was locked together but then this horrific water from underneath the earth and this canopy that was above the earth flooded for 40 days and 40 nights the entire world. It wasn't just in a certain location. And so that's important to remember because the Bible says the entire world was flooded, not just a certain area. And we believe the Bible, do we not? The third, the flood came suddenly, without warning. For hundred, well, that's not we had had warning. For 120 years, Noah preached repentance. We see it in 2 Peter 2:5, and he built an ark, and not a drop of rain occurred until the first day of the beginning of the flood. And so, this canopy of clouds above was created a downpour and the waters from, from heaven uh, that the earth's crust explodes upward, then God closed the door of the ark. And so it happened very suddenly. Most people were just going and got their merry way. Then paid attention to Moses preaching. And that's what happens today. We'll see in a minute. We hear, you hear the word of God but we leave here going on our merry way and our lives never really change. And so it happened very suddenly as well. So God's future judgment will be historical, universal, universal, and will come suddenly as well. Historically, in Acts uh, 17.31, listen to what uh, uh, Luke, Dr. Luke says in Acts. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having uh, furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead, talking about Christ. And so one day there will be a worldwide judgment. One day, everybody, one day if you're not in Jesus Christ, you will stand before the white throne judgment and God will say to you, I never knew you, depart from me. One day, there's going to be a, a judgment again. And this judgment is going to be one of fire. Fire, as it says in the book of Revelation, it is going to be a judgment of fire that comes upon the entire earth as well. And so they, again, second, it is universal. He will judge the world, every person who has ever lived, those who have taken refuge in Christ will be spared, or all who are outside of Christ, will appear before the great white throne where those whose names are not written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. Now that doesn't bring a little start to your soul. Amen. Because guess what? You're going to die. Amen. I have a dear friend in Charlottesville, my lawyer, uh, he found out in December he had bone cancer in his jaw and now the cancer is all over his body and he has about two weeks to live. We can't escape it. That's right. And so my plea to you is that you know without a shadow of a doubt that you will be, that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life and that you will be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see that more clear in a minute. But it will be sudden, not without warning. Now the scriptures give us a warning. It tells us very clearly that God is coming again. The second coming 
it is called in Scripture, God is coming again. And so he warns us through Scripture that it won't be a flood, but it will be a fire uh, that will be coming before us. In Matthew 24, 36-39, this is what Jesus said, but of, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For, all, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now again, the question is this. Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Amen. Then you must believe that Jesus is coming again. Amen. And you don't know when. It could just happen. It could happen right now. Amen. Praise God. I hope it does. Yes. But he's coming again. And you've got to be ready. You see, I, I am like Peter or like Noah. I, I, I'm preaching repentance. And the question is, are you hearing? Are you hearing that Jesus Christ is the only way? Listen to what Peter says in, in his writing in 2, in 2 Peter 3, 3-9. Three through 9. Listen to Peter. Know this first of all, that in the last days, markers and mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so Peter is saying, you know, just like in the days of Noah, fire is coming to destroy the entire earth. Not just a portion of the earth, but the entire earth. So that brings us to the question, we must take the means of escape God has provided. God graciously provides a means of escape from His judgment. Jesus is our ark. Just like Noah and his family had an avenue of escape, the ark, our ark is Jesus. He is the only way that you can get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And no one can come to, to the Father except through me. Most people think, listen, most people think their goodness will get them to heaven. They think their good works will get them to heaven. None of that is going to get you to heaven. Because you can't do enough good works to please a holy God. Amen. But Jesus did it all for you. Jesus went to a cross, and we'll be celebrating next Sunday. He went to a cross, and He took all of your sin, past, present, and future, and He imputed to your life, or credited to your life, righteousness. And so when you come to Him by faith, through grace, then you become a follower, a child of God, because you believe in His death, burial, and resurrection according to the Scriptures. There is an escape for you. You don't have to fear because Jesus is the only way of escape. And Jesus, is just like the ark, had only one door. Jesus is the only door that you have to, that you go through to come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Listen to the Apostle John in John chapter 10. Listen to what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, he does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, 
but climbs up some other way. He is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a sheep, a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. The question is this. Do you know the voice of God? You can say, well, how do I know the voice of God? Because you hear the Word of God, and the Word of God makes sense to you. It resonates with you. If you don't know the voice of God, everything I've said to you is just like Greek, foreign. So are you a sheep in the shepherd's fold? Because you have gone through the door. You see, there's only one door, just like there's only one door in the ark as well. But finally, to know about the ark is not enough. To know about Jesus is not enough. You can know all about Jesus, you know. You say, "Yeah, I've heard all about Jesus. I, you know, I, I, I hear, I hear about Jesus." But here's the key: Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you really understand Jesus? Do you know Jesus as a friend? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Noah and his family had a relationship with God. And because of their righteousness given to them by God, God gave them a way of escape, which was the ark. And then he sent the flood. Today, as I said, our ark is Jesus Christ. He has given you a way to escape. And he is the only way to escape the fire that is about to come upon this earth. Of the tribulation is about to come upon this earth. And so the takeaway is this. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. God invited Noah and his family aboard the ark with these words in 7-1. Enter the ark. Or as the King James puts it, come into the ark. That is his invitation to you, to you today. God has not yet closed the door of salvation to you. The door is still open right now. And you can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As, as Isaiah tells us, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. The appeal from Revelation, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes wishes take the water of life without cost. And finally he says in Revelation 22, 20, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. The Lord Jesus is coming to judge the earth, and He invites you to come aboard before He comes to close the door. He is holy God, full of love and wrath. He invites you to come to Jesus now. And so my friends, the flood story is the story for today. It's an evangelistic story. It's a story about you coming to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. As I said last week, talking about Kevin Bailey, he was here in church. And then that Sunday afternoon, he had a motorcycle accident. And according to Peggy, he's good, he's good as he's going to get. He's got 80% hold now because of his motorcycle accident. So my concern, as I was thinking through the sermon this week, my concern is for you knowing Jesus Christ, that your children know Jesus Christ, that your grandchildren know Jesus Christ. You see, you can be the best parent or grandparent in the world, but if you're not pointing your child or your grandchild to Jesus, 
you're failing your grandchild. You're failing your child. You are the light and salt. They're looking to you. They're looking to you to show them the way of Jesus Christ. Your co-workers are looking to you. They, you say you go to church, they're looking to you to point to Jesus Christ. Your neighbors see you go to church and they're looking to you to have a, to have a, to show them a way of life. My neighbor across the street has cancer. And, and I was out in the yard working and he was working. So he came, he came over and talked to me. He said, Lindsay, how do I pray? He said, I bargain with God all the time. I said, you don't need a bargain with God. Amen. Just have a conversation with Him. Just have a conversation with Him. See, that's what we're about. Because hopefully, each one of you will come through the door. That door is Jesus. And you know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. So I put I behoove you, I implore you to lead your children to Jesus, your grandchildren to Jesus. Talk to them about the Lord. 